to me, the research that we've undertaken in this program and in other programs is about looking forward. It's about looking at where the industry is going to be in 10 years, in 20 years, and what are the challenges we're going to have in those 10 and 20 years. We were trying to gain a, 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 some information that we could use to underpin our practices. So information that when we were burning, is that affecting water quality and quantity or not? Or are there ways of implementing that prescribed burning in a way that minimises the impact on water quality and water quantity? And in the same way with carbon, you know, how, how is our burning affecting plant growth? How is it affecting the atmosphere? Um, are there ways or things that we can do to lessen that or minimise that? One thing we wanted to look at was how changes in fuel moisture content not only affect the flammability of the fuel, but how products from burning that fuel, the smoke products, are actually formed. If you're applying energy to a fuel to try and get it to burn, if there's a lot of moisture, a lot of that energy is going to be used to try and drive the moisture out, to basically evaporate it. By doing so, there's less energy available to drive combustion. So rather than driving sort of complete combustion, which is turning the fuel basically into carbon dioxide and water, there's not enough energy to drive that process all the way through. So what you end up with is with less oxidised products like carbon monoxide, more volatile organic compounds, or even the production of more particulate matter, because you're not burning everything completely through to carbon dioxide or water. We know now if they're burning when it's drier, they're actually getting more carbon dioxide relative to say carbon monoxide and the amount of volatile organic compounds and they're the compounds that very often lead to the formation of ozone. The project I was looking at um, was looking at how much water is used by a forest in a catchment. It's important to know because most of the um, catchments in South East Australia are forested. 50% of them are Alpine ash and the other 50% are mixed species forests. We know how alpine ash and mountain ash respond to fire. There's really lots of research in that area to show that yields of um, water entering the catchment are reduced for a prolonged period after a fire. But for mixed species forests, there was almost no data. We didn't know how the canopy reacted to fire. We didn't know how much water um, moved through the canopy. We selected paired, burnt and unburnt forests and um, went out for three years in a row to try and capture just different elements of canopy biology as it um, regenerated from the fire. So the important finding we had from our measurements of sap flow in the burnt and unburnt forests was that a tree that's regenerating after the fire by abacormic branches uses no more water than the unburnt counterpart. For example with fire in an ash type forest if you have a, a crown removing fire that water that's sucked up by the regenerating seedlings takes out about 100 years worth of reduced yield for the catchment. Whereas in a mixed species forest, we think because the trees are already constrained by their root architecture, they aren't going to use more water as they regenerate. They're just going to construct a canopy that's already dependent on the architecture that they have below. From that um, particular piece of work, we've now got something that land managers can use with just an Excel spreadsheet to um, quantify how much tree water use will be happening in a particular forest type. Fire impacts on both the, the quality of water and the, the quantity of water from catchments. Our work is, is focused on trying to better understand uh, the risks to water quality and ways to reduce those uh, negative impacts on water quality and water supply after fire. The research involved a combination of both modelling and field experimentation. The modelling was focused on trying to understand the, the risk or predicting the likelihood of these kind of contamination events, whereas the uh, field work was focusing on the processes, the erosion processes, and we used that to try and pinpoint which uh, catchments and which parts of the landscape are most at risk of contaminating water supplies. The most important finding from the research is that um, post-fire water quality impacts in, in this part of the world predominantly result from this, this little known process called post-fire debris flows. Debris flows uh, result from very intense thunderstorms and a very unusual process because of the, the large magnitude and they uh, 
result in very large quantities of sediment and nutrients being delivered to, to rivers and reservoirs very quickly. Since undertaking the research, our focus has really shifted to uh, where these processes can occur and the magnitude of them. So we're able to now kind of pinpoint catchments that are particularly at risk, so ones where you want to, might want to manage your plan burning better, or you might want to be ready with um, uh, you know, alternative water supplies after a wildfire, for example. It's increasingly important for land managers to be able to justify through the peer-reviewed literature to be able to point to evidence and have an evidence based for land management's decisions uh, in uh, knowing the outcomes or predicting the outcomes of uh, forest burning on, on carbon. One of the reasons that uh, researchers here at the University of Melbourne were drawn into this project is because of our expertise in forest biomass calculations and measurements and we teamed up with some of the operational level fire managers to look at before and after impacts of burning on forest carbon and we used our existing skills and expertise in measuring forest carbon to measure the outcomes of fire. Prior to our project we had some fragmented knowledge about carbon stored in litter uh, and trees, but we really didn't have much of a knowledge of, about carbon stored in green vegetation and big coarse woody debris, thin sticks and dead wood. One of the unexpected outcomes was the extent to which the larger pieces of fuel, coarse woody debris and standing dead trees, contribute to carbon losses because they burn for longer than the fine fuels, often for hours uh, and days, sometimes even weeks, and the greenhouse gas releases from these fuels tends more to the methane end of the spectrum. Methane has a strong global warming potential, 21 times that of CO2, and therefore it's important for us to, uh, to know the impact of fuel reduction burning on these heavier fuels as well. As well as being relevant to land managers making decisions about uh, fuel reduction burning on forest carbon, our results inform the National Carbon Accounting Initiative to better estimate uh, emissions from forest fires at a national level. I suppose the exciting thing for me that drives me is that we're learning from this as land managers and being better land managers. You know, admitting we don't know everything and what we've got to do is more research to underpin what we're doing, change our practices if needed or reinforce the practices that we're doing.